So we are considering a dynamically rebalanced portfolio. And for what concerns that portfolio, we now add another restriction, which is um, that will turn to be essential in the rest of the course. That's the definition of self-financing portfolio. So a dynamically rebalanced portfolio, and as I told you, for us, virtually every time it will be also bounded, it is self-financing if it respects a very simple balance equation. Heuristically speaking, what we require is the following. We build a portfolio at time zero. So at time zero, obviously, we have our own funds, or we get our money in some way, for example, short selling, because we are allowed to do that. But after building the portfolio at time zero, over time, we intervene on the portfolio, so we rebalance the portfolio for sure, but we do not add extra funds and we do not remove funds from the portfolio. So we do not add and we do not withdraw from the portfolio. Our portfolio will change its value over time. It's obvious that given our definition of the value of the portfolio, the value of the portfolio will change over time because S is a stochastic process, because A is a stochastic process, okay? So the value VT very rarely will be the value of VT plus three. It can be, for sure, but in principle, it changes. But in order for our portfolio to be self-financing, We require the following. We will give two definitions of self-financing portfolio, one in discrete time and one in continuous time. We start with the discrete time situation and the continuous time will come when we enter in the Black and Scholes framework. That's the following. We require that if we take the sum k equal to one up to k of our portfolio as t plus one uh, let's be consistent, so theta, theta, t plus 1, a, k, omega, s, t plus 1, a, k, omega. What is that? This is the value of our portfolio at time t plus 1, okay? What we require is that this value, that is to say, when we rebalance our portfolio at time t plus 1, and we get the new value of the portfolio, this value needs to be equal to the value of the old portfolio at the new prices. So we require that this is equal to k equal to 1 capital K of theta t a k omega s t plus 1 a k omega. Why? Because of the reason I was telling you before. So we put our money in the portfolio time zero. We make our portfolio evolve over time. But every time we intervene on the portfolio, we do that with the funds that are in the portfolio. We do not add extra money. We do not take out money of the portfolio until capital T. In capital T, if we have enough money, we go and have a pizza together. But before that, no. Okay? We just always use our money in the portfolio to change our portfolio and rebalance it. So this is the balance equation that defines a self-financing portfolio. We will see that in Black and Scholes, that nevertheless is a fundamental theorem in financial mathematics with very good properties, but also a lot of points of weakness that I will stress a lot, the result of Black and Scholes, there is this sort of strange understanding that the result of Black and Scholes is not the pricing of a European coal, is not the pricing of an American put, is not that. So the pricing formula that you get is a result. Black and Scholes 
tells something that is very important. It tells us that if I consider whatever financial assets on the market that satisfies a certain number of uh, conditions that we will state, then the value of that asset can always be replicated by the means of a self-financing portfolio. And we can use the self-financing portfolio properly built in order to study the value process of the asset. Okay, but it needs to be a self-financing portfolio. Otherwise, the, the theorem does not, does not hold. So it's very important that we keep this definition in, uh, in mind. Little detail. In this course, we will say strategy and portfolio with the same meaning. So for us, they are more or less synonyms. If you want to be very picky, if you want to be very precise, they are different things. A strategy is not a portfolio. It's the same difference that lies between a video and a photo shot. That's exactly the same meaning. The strategy is the video, is the movie. The portfolio is the photo shot. So you have a strategy, which is a portfolio that changes over time. At any time t, when you take a photo shot, that's the portfolio. But for us, it's okay. I don't care too much about this distinction, but it's it's important uh, to know it. <clears throat> now, second fundamental definition that we immediately apply to get a very very important result: the definition of risk neutral measure. So you can always be very pedantic with definition. For example, another thing, if you want to be very picky, you have to say it's a risk neutral probability measure. Because if you say risk neutral measure, there is no guarantee that is a probability measure. And if you say risk neutral probability, then you have to specify in which settings you are. In the cold model of one, and then yes, more or less is the same stuff. Or in the definite one, because if you are in the definite one, probability is not sigma, sigma additive. A probability measure is sigma additive, but a probability it is not. It's just finitely additive. So, in any case, you can be always very pedantic, but I don't care too much. So, <clears throat> the risk neutral probability measure is what? We call a probability measure Q on a measurable space omega. F, if you want a T, to be risk neutral, sometimes also known as the equivalent measure. Uh, sorry, not the. Uh, equivalent, well, you could just say Martingale measure. A probability measure such that if for a risk free asset with R, so with a deterministic return R, that would be our risk-free rate. So if for a risk-free asset with R, that in principle can be positive or negative, it will never be minus infinity, it will never be plus infinity because it makes no sense, otherwise we can close and go having a beer. Because who would invest in a market if you have a plus infinity return on something that is risk-free? Okay, so if for a risk-free asset with R fixed, we have that the value at time zero of every portfolio, so we take a generic portfolio, and the value at time zero of that portfolio is equal 
to the discounted value under the risk-free asset of the expected value under the measure Q of the value of the portfolio at maturity. If under Q this is true, so if the value at time zero of every portfolio corresponds to the discounted expected value under that measure of the portfolio at maturity, we call the measure Q the risk neutral measure. So if I have a probability space and I have a measure that satisfies that, I call that risk neutral. In our course, Q will be the risk neutral measure and P will typically be the physical measure. Because nothing guarantees that P is able to satisfy this condition. Actually, it does not satisfy this condition. And that's why we have to introduce the, the risk neutral measure. So under a risk neutral measure, so we call a measure, I repeat, risk neutral, if under that measure, so if we take the expectation of our round of quantities with respect to that measure, then the value at time zero of every portfolio, and when I say every portfolio, it's like saying every asset, because I can always think of an asset as a portfolio containing just that asset, okay? So the present value of every quantity in the economy is what is equal to the discounted expected value under the measure Q of the value of the portfolio at maturity where the discounting is made with respect to the risk-free rate, okay? This is what we call the risk-neutral risk measure. Now, we will see that the risk-neutral measure is what we aim to find, for example, using our exponential martingale, or rather nicotine derivative, when we will consider Cameron Martin, when we introduce the generalized exponential Martin deal with Girsanov, this will be all trick to try to move from the physical measure to the risk neutral measure. And why do we want to play with the risk neutral measure? Because the risk neutral measure has a lot of very useful properties. The first thing that we can show is that if a market is characterized by a risk-free asset, and on the market there is at least, because there can be more than one, but there is at least one risk-neutral measure, under that risk-neutral measure, the discounted price process is a martingale. And when next week we introduce the fundamental theorems of asset pricing, we will have a fundamental result that states that under a risk neutral measure, there is no possibility of arbitrage. So it's not possible to have a free lunch to get money for free. So there is always risk involved. Okay? Otherwise, it would make no sense to not to choose the risk free investment. Okay, so let's show the following. Let M be a market with risk-free rate R characterized, characterized by a risk neutral measure Q. So if you want, this is our U. Then the discounted price process
e to the minus r t s t. Later on, we will call this guy just s t tilde. That will be the discounted price process. The discounted price process is a martingale with respect to its natural filtration and the filtration for us as usual is FT. So this is what we want to prove that if we have a risk neutral measure now uh, we have this very interesting property, which is extremely, extremely important uh, to us. Because knowing that a process is a martingale simplifies a lot of the treatment of the process itself. We know that if we condition our process on the available information that for us is represented by the filtration, we can always say that the present value is the best measure of what we expect to be the value of the process in the future. So I mean, it's a very important type of, of information. We can also define other type of uh, processes with other properties. Uh, there are very strange approaches in mathematical finance that do not require, for example, martingality, but then they are very theoretical. This is not what is used every day for the pricing of, of stuff. So, um, let's try to, to prove that and to see why it is important that we have our risk neutral measure. That remember is the measure such that the value times zero of the portfolio is equal to the discounted expected value of the portfolio at maturity. We discounted made with respect to R. Now, what I will do for you. is to prove the result, because I'm lazy, for R equal to zero. So when the risk-free asset gives no interest. Okay, so you put your money there, it is safe, you will get your money back. For sure, inflation is not a problem, so we don't care about that, but you don't get any interest. At the same time, you are lucky because you don't have to pay the bank to store your money. That would be a negative interest rate. What I leave to you, as exercises are the situation R positive, or if you want, non-negative, but that includes mine, and also negative. Essentially, the way in which you solve for both positive and negative is the same. There is no difference. The difference will come later. Because if we stop here and we do not introduce the fundamental theorems of asset pricing, then fine, it works and it's true, it's totally okay. But for example, the fundamental theorems of asset pricing, the first one tells us that under the risk neutral measure, there can be no arbitrage. And one thing that you can immediately show if you write it down is that with a negative interest rate, you can build a very simple arbitrage. So automatically, the measure you are considering contradicts the first theorem, so it's not risk neutral. So we need to add something extra. So what I ask you to do is solve this. That's easy. You just have to slightly change what I will do for r equal to 0, and start thinking about this situation. That at this stage, you can still solve but that contradicts the first theorem of asset pricing unless we change a little bit the center. And we will be back when we cover that. Okay, so what we want to do, without any loss of generality, let's consider t to be 0, 1, 2, blah, 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 up to t minus 1, okay? What we want to show is that if I take the expectation under Q, of st plus 1 conditioned on ft, this is equal to st, 
Okay, this is what what we want to what we want to show. But I guess you recall from your courses in probability that this condition is equivalent to another condition, which is the following. I can take whatever event f in Ft, and I need this to be true. The expectation on the Q of st plus 1, the indicator of f, needs to be equal to the expectation on the Q O's, obviously, of st, the indicator of f. Okay, these are just two equivalent statements. So let's see how I can prove that this is actually the case, that under the risk neutral measure, I have the martingality. I'm not, for example, I'm given for granted measurability and adaptivity. Now, adaptivity is trivial, because we know by definition that every process is adapt with respect to its natural filtration. Okay, so the fact that FT is the natural filtration of the press process, the fact that ST is adapted to that filtration, it's obvious. And for what concerns measurability, again, we are playing with portfolios that all our random quantities, if it's not clear, are obviously in the H2 class. So, as I told you from now on, when we play with something that is random, we are still there because we end up with the Eto integral. So we want to be able to play with that. So also the measurability part is uh, given for granted. So what we really have to prove is that part. Now, for a mathematician, what we are going to do now, it's a little bit disturbing, I can tell you. Because what we will try to show, and it's a technique that we will use over and over and over again in our course is to build a strategy that proves that what we want to state is true. So we actively build a strategy. Remember that in this world we can do whatever we want. We don't have particular constraints, as I told you. We are intelligent, we can make all the computations, we can buy, we can sell, we can short sell. That is to say, we can sell things that we don't have under the promise that we will be able, obviously, to give it to the buyer when it is uh, necessary. So we can do everything. And if you short sell, what happens? You don't have a quantity, you sell it to the buyer, the buyer pays you, so you already have the money, and then you are obliged at a certain point to give to the buyer the quantity that you sold. But the idea is that in the meantime, using the money that you got, you built your strategy and you were able to do that. Okay? So let's see what we let's see what we can do. Considering the follow, consider the following strategy. Take a time tau and for tau equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, up to t, do nothing, which I like as a strategy. Do nothing. You don't buy, you don't sell anything. What's the value of your portfolio? Zero. So you are doing nothing, okay? You don't have anything in your portfolio. Or if you want, you can think of a portfolio that accounts for zero shares of the different assets, but the value of the portfolio is zero. Then consider the situation in which tau is equal to is equal to t minus one, sorry. T. Then consider the situation in which tau is equal to t and assume that the event F can manifest itself. Whatever F, okay? Whatever F. For me, F can be my favorite rock star enters the room now. Okay? 
If it happens, I do something. If it does not happen, I turn tau equal to t, I do nothing. So if f does not manifest itself, so if my favorite rock star does not enter the room, I do nothing. So the value of the strategy is still zero. If conversely, my favorite rock star manifests itself in the room, probably I stop teaching, but in any case, what do I do? I build the following strategy. I short sell ST units of the risk free. ST. ST is the price of our risky asset, obviously, because otherwise it would make no sense to speak in terms of expectations. So S for us is the, the stock, if you want, is the risky asset. And if I sell ST units of the risk-free, that conversely is the zero coupon risk-free bond or the bank account, whatever I want, that represents the risk-free rate, what happens? I sell the risk free and I get what? An amount of money that corresponds to ST. Okay, so I'm under the promise of giving it back, short selling, I get immediately ST. And what do I do? I invest ST, I buy one unit of the stock. So I don't, I don't have anything, I don't have money in my portfolio, but I short sell ST units of the risk-free asset, and with the amount that I get, which is ST, I buy one unit of the stock, because that's the price of one unit of the stock, okay? This is my strategy. if F manifests itself. If F does not happen, I do nothing. Okay, so if I do nothing, the value of my strategy is zero. If F manifests itself, what I do, a short sell as the units of the risk-free, and with the amount I get, which is exactly ST, I buy one unit of the stock, okay? At time t plus 1, whatever happens, even if there is my favorite rock star, whatever happens, I complete my strategy. That is the following. I sell the stock and get S t plus 1, because now we are in t plus 1. Okay, so the price of the stock has possibly changed, and now the value of the stock is ST plus 1. So I sell the only unit I have of the stock, and the amount I get is invested in the risk-free rate. So how can I summarize my strategy? What's the value of my strategy? It is at time t plus 1, s t plus 1 minus s t, because I have a short sold, so s t plus 1, s t, under the condition that the event f manifests itself. If f does not manifest itself, obviously this guy is immediately zero because the indicator is zero. Otherwise, this is my object. Okay. But if this is the case, what do we have? We have the following. The value of my strategy at time t plus one is this one, okay? Is st plus one minus st, condition on the fact that event f manifests itself. 
Now, what I'm interested to, to know is what happens at maturity. But what I can tell you is that from t plus 2 up to t, I do nothing. I just maintain my portfolio as it is. That guy. So, what is the expected value of my portfolio at maturity at that point? In T, the expected value of my portfolio is ST plus 1 minus ST, indicator of F. This is the value of my portfolio at time capital T, but since we are not changing, and these are quantities I sold and invested in the risk-free uh, in the risk-free asset at this very moment. Obviously, the fact that in the meantime the price of the price process has changed is not a big deal for me because I froze everything at time t and t plus one. But why it is important to consider this now? Because what we are saying is that we are operating under the risk neutral measure. So this is true under the risk neutral measure. But if we are under the risk neutral measure, what's the definition of risk neutral measure? Is the measure such that the value of the portfolio times zero is equal to the discounted value of the portfolio at maturity. So it means that the value of the portfolio times zero is zero, because until F manifests itself, I was doing nothing. That's the first thing. So at time zero, the value of the portfolio is zero. And zero needs to be equal to the discounted value under the risk neutral measure. And I'm taking that with respect to the risk free asset. But remember that in my example, I'm assuming this to be zero. So if you want, this guy disappears. OK? Or what? Or this. Okay, now it's just a matter of rearranging the terms and exploiting the linearity of the, of the expectation, because I can always say that this is equal to this. And this is possible because Q is the risk neutral measure. So I know that this needs to be true. For me, in this specific situation, the discounting does not count because I'm assuming R equal to zero. For you, for whom R is different from zero, you have to think a little bit how to deal with this discounting term. But the idea is the following. So I build a strategy, and according to this strategy, it is totally true that I have this Martingality property for the discounted price process. So it's, it's very important. Having the risk neutral measure guarantees that the discounted price process is actually a martingale. The big problem for us is also to guarantee that the risk neutral measure is unique. Because if I introduce the risk neutral measure to get rid of the fact that the physical measure can be subject to our different perceptions, it makes no sense to introduce 20 different risk neutral measures. We want one. And this is the job of the first and the second theorem of asset price, guaranteeing that under the risk neutral measure there is no arbitrage, so there is no free lunch, and guaranteeing that the risk neutral measure is actually unique. Now, in order to reach that topic, we have to give the formal definition of arbitrage. Now, what is an arbitrage? Prosaically speaking, an arbitrage is this famous free lunch. Okay, so the lady before was telling you that if you go there, there is free lunch. Actually, it's not free lunch because you have to listen to what they say. So you pay for that. Then, if you like to listen to what they say, it's one thing. But in principle, nothing is for free. So, how we give the formal definition of arbitrage, which is the object we want to avoid? 
and will tell you why. Now, there are different definitions of arbitrage. You can, say, you can have a strong arbitrage and a weak arbitrage. We will essentially just play with, uh, with the second ones, with the weak arbitrage, which is an object of this type. For us, an arbitrage is a portfolio or an asset such that the value in zero is equal to zero. And in, at maturity, at time capital T, the probability that V capital T is non-negative is equal to 1. And the probability that V capital T is strictly positive is positive. So it means that it's a portfolio that costs nothing to us to build, that for sure does not generate a loss, and possibly a return. This is what we call the arbitrage. 